the Irish American Writers and Arts, you'll be most welcome to join us. We are not Irish, really. We are not American. What we are concentrating on mostly is your artistry. So songsters, guitar players, dancers, painters, poets, and novelists, any art that you have, you are welcome. So our business is love of art, love of each other, and have love, life, laughter. Welcome everyone. Welcome to our March 28th Salon of Irish America Writers and Artists. For those who are new to this organization, you need to know that we celebrate the achievements of Irish American writers and artists, past and present. And we aim to highlight, energize, and encourage Irish Americans active in the arts. We support artistic freedom, human rights, and social justice. And I wanna thank the Salon Committee, especially Brendan Costello, for giving me the privilege of hosting, being your host this afternoon for me evening. Um, so for this evening's Salon, we have musicians, poets, authors, and fil a filmmaker um, coming to you all through the magic, magic sometimes, of Zoom. Um, some will be coming from Washington, DC. Um, New York will be, be in the house. There are four of us who will be uh, this, this evening are coming from California, including me. And so we've been hanging around a bit. So I, sa I say, let's just get started. So I'd like to introduce our first uh, performer. Abby Palmer has been playing Celtic harp since 1999 and specializes in traditional Celtic and Renaissance music, as well as fusion and other genre influences. When performing and collaborating, Abby, has four, Abby now has four full length albums, one which is collaborated with her mom, which she just told me is a fiddle player, also a professional Celtic musician. She enjoys composing as well as arranging in traditional Celtic style. Welcome, Abby. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um... So again, it's it's a it's a pleasure to be here. I, I just have a a couple tunes to share with everybody today, um, and it's also so so amazing for us all to join um, nationally. You know, just from from all different coasts. So very nice to be here. Um, so I'm going to start with a, a harp tune called um, "O oh Carolyn's Welcome," and then I'm going to go into a hornpipe called "Rights of Man." Um, and for anyone who knows, I also, I love the harp and the intro music. That was fun. Um, <laughs> so if anyone knows anything about uh, Celtic harp, um, you probably have heard of Terrell O'Carolyn, who was a uh, Irish uh, composer and he was also a harper. And um, I have a theory, so he was, he was actually blind. Um, and I have a theory that there's actually a lot of um, harp composers who were blind um, from that era in kind of like the late 1600s, early 1700s. And I, I personally think it's because the harp is very laid out so that um, you really don't have to look at the strings. Um, so, so I'm going to start with uh, O'Carolyn's Welcome and then I'm going to do a little pipe. Thank you. 
How was the sound? Could everyone hear it okay? Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Awesome. Yeah, very um, I know we're, I'm sorry? It was very good. It was lovely. Awesome. It was good. lovely. Mm -hmm. So I prepared one more piece, but um, I know we're getting a little bit of a late start, so I'm happy to end there and toss the mic back. What, what do you, what does everyone think? Um, yeah, I know we, we did start late, but um, I actually really loved your heart playing. <laughs> um, uh, I, I would I would vote for another we song. We always start we late. I vote for a song, too. Okay. Play, Fair so, enough. Please play, play another one, please. Okay. All righty. Cool. Um, so I'm going to actually do another um, O'Carolyn piece. And this is kind of uh, a little bit of what Lori was saying in the intro, I kind of approach Celtic music with a, a slight fusion twist sometimes, which is kind of fun. Um, so uh, so there's a poet, an Irish poet named um, uh, William Yeats. I'm sure everyone has heard of him. And he wrote the, a poem for a piece called Fanny Power that O'Carolyn um, wrote. And usually we always know Fanny Power is... <laughs> It's very bouncy, very light, you know. But this poem that he wrote um, is is quite the opposite of bouncy and light. It's quite um, uh, broody and perhaps even, dare I say, angsty. Um, so I, I heard a friend play this in a minor key recently, and it fit the content of the lyrics. So I thought that it was maybe an appropriate um, contribution to this evening, given that we have writers and poets on the call as well. So this is Fanny Power. Mm -hmm. 
to being able to see other people's presentations as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for persevering with the, our, uh, our check-in uh, as well. But uh, Abby, I just wanted to say, give me broody and angsty any day, any time over bouncy, really. It was, a, I just loved <laughs> I, that rendition. I have to agree. I have to agree. <laughs> it's the Celtic vibe, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's very, it has, has to be broody, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, so thank you again, Abby. Um, and uh, I, uh, I'd i like to move on to our next performer who I feel has gotten to be a friend. And I really only met him through Irish America artist. Um, and um, someone, there's someone needs to come in. Um, and uh, he, the, I've been, this will be my third time hosting Sorry, I accidentally muted you. <laughs> okay, I consider Larry and James Ross um, my lucky my lucky uh, charms for uh, having a successful um, uh, salon. And um, and I'd also like to give a shout out to Larry um, before I do his formal introduction because Larry has taken that theme of Irish America artists and writers, which is to um, energize and encourage, 
And he's taken it on himself to organize a, a historical writer's workshop that will be held this summer in Ireland. And when he completes his reading, I would really, I would really like to encourage him to talk a little bit about that because it's, I think it's kind of, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a theme of what this organization I feel is all about. One of my early times I've seen a, um, um, a video advertising or talking about Irish America artists. And one of the things Malachi McCourt says is that we are artists, there, there, there could be people who have our Pulitzer Prize winning, or there could be the, a, a teacher from Queens who's a poet working on her first book. And as someone who was a teacher in Queens, I always, I'm, I have been very happy how welcoming Irish America artist has been. Um, and Larry embodies that too. So uh, Larry McLaughlin, his career has been devoted to developing research and educational programs in clean energy. Um, at colleges and universities. He has also a passion for history and considers himself a student of American writers like David McCullough and uh, Walter Isaacson, pretty, pretty good writers. After uh, several stays in the Dingle Peninsula, um, McLaughlin became intrigued with specific events in Irish history and how they shape the attitudes and politics of Ireland today. In the it was the connection of Ireland's ancient past to recent events that inspired his book, The Four Kings of Ireland, a novel he wrote about, six, about the 60 years of war, murder, and betrayal that set Ireland on course to become the divided land and the hope of the saints that still echoes in the chasm today. I'd like to welcome Larry McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Laurie, and um, thank you for reaching out to me as a uh, Fellow California. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Everybody can hear me okay. We had a little trouble with the microphone earlier. Um, it's not, we'll just press through and press maybe through. we'll get the yeah. distance. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the introduction, probably a little bit longer than it should have been. Uh, <laughs> I probably should have sent something a little a little shorter than that. So, oh, okay. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I really enjoy writing about, um, about history, about uh, Irish history in particular. And um, Workshop that Lori mentioned. I'll, I'll I'll give you a little more detail, just a little bit more when I'm finished here. But um, for now, I'm going to read to you a uh, Christmas story. It was a story uh, featured in Iris Central's uh, Christmas edition, and also tourism website. <laughs> so so uh, I was kind of proud of that. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity to read this. It, the title is called "A Quiet Christmas in Dingle." During the winter months, most tourists are gone and the residents are left to enjoy a quiet holiday season. I guess my family and I can be considered tourists by some. I like to think of myself as an occasional guest, you know, like a, like a distant relative that pops in from time to time. Cottage owned by one of the old families on the Dingle Peninsula. Rivet's cottage was a three bedroom and two bath with sweeping view of mountain slopes and farmlands in the valley below. Of sheep grazed on the slopes throughout most of our stay. There was a white stone cottage with a red Dutch door just on the other side of Mount Brandon, Dingle, that had a fireplace in which we burned wood and recipe for added warmth. It was mostly rural and home to a substantial portion of County Kerry's Gaelic speaking residents. Much of the signage and news are still in the traditional Irish language. And one of the simple highlights of my stay there was a conversation I had with a farmer who lived down the lane from I was out working in the front yard of his farmhouse while I was taking a walk one misty morning. The gentleman waved a friendly greeting, so I stopped to introduce myself and tell him I was in the neighborhood. I had a lovely conversation, I think. Uh, very friendly, but I could only understand a phrase here and there. He spoke with a lyrical mix of English and traditional Irish. So went Christmas shopping to $20 each. So after a day of shopping for coffee mugs and trinkets, dinner was one of Dingle's finest. Indeed, some of the best food in Ireland is served in its pubs. They were open during the holidays except for Christmas Day. Same welcoming ambiance, traditional music, great food and drink are enjoyed by local patrons year round. It's consistent service is um, for locals. Well, gives definition to my use of the term genuine. 
And I personally take comfort knowing it's there, whether the tourists are there or not. Only in the way, we enjoy great music at John Benny Moriarty's and just the welcoming atmosphere in these pubs is accentuated with lights strung about and fires in the fireplace during the winter holiday nights. Traveling home at night provides a reminder of the true reason for the season. It's a tradition there in Ireland to place a single white candle in each window to honor the bird cards. Candles were present in shop windows and in windows of almost every home we passed. On a clear night after dinner, while driving on the road that made a steady rise over the hill to our cottage, I became aware of how widely this tradition is observed through the community. Seaside town sparkled in the night with the glowing light in almost every house and window. Over 200 years, fishermen there have sought refuge in the, from the life's many storms in St. Mary's Catholic Church. Located on Green Street between Harbor and Main Street, so it offers a sanctuary and garden respite in the center of town. We really appreciate the Irish culture, tradition, and spirit. One must understand the role of the Catholic Church in Ireland, especially in its small towns. For centuries, it has effectively woven together Catholic liturgy and rule with strands of color from the ancient Celtic traditions. Before they experience Christmas in Bengal, one should attend evening mass on Christmas Eve. Attending services on Christmas Eve was part of my wife's upbringing in Ohio, uh, but for me, it turned out to be the most meaningful experience of our visit. It was scheduled start time at St. Mary's and parishioners were still arriving. Families arrived with their children. Several came directly from the soccer field with boys dressed in shorts and teen jerseys under the winter coats. Two red brothers wore the uniforms while singing in a children's choir. The procession began and our sins were filled with music, incense, and traditional carols. The service was conducted with readings alternating between English and Irish. What a beautiful way to hear the word of God. A sermon about the birth of Christ in Bethlehem was delivered by the priest directly to the children who were periodically asked questions about baby Jesus, the manger, and what happened next. Answers were shouted in reply with childlike simplicity and beautiful Irish accents. Service ended with a quiet carol sung by candlelight. Some glass windows glowed in the darkened day with a presence from night being outside. Adults exchanged holiday wishes and the children scurried for one last visit with friends, all doing well to respect the reverend town. The family filed out with the parishioners through the large wooden doors and out into the cool night air. Snow. We joined the others walking up Green Street to their parked cars. Some had umbrellas. The snow simply fell on our shoulders and hair. Shops along the way had closed earlier in the evening, but their window decorations still shone bright. White lights were strung along the street overhead, swagging from one side to the other. I pulled my scarf a little tighter and took it all in. There was no bother at all. In this moment, my family and I were part of the community to college for a quiet Christmas in Dingle. Oh, don't Thank know you. if it's, you mean, you know, it's a little bit after Christmas, a few months later, and uh, probably would have been more appropriate in the earlier and previous uh, salon, but uh, I for one can use a little Christmas right now and uh, Yes. The same for you. So um, if I may, I'll take advantage of the opportunity to tell you about this workshop. I'd like we're you conducting to it. We're conducting it for Irish and American new writers, new history. We're going to be in Carford, Ireland on August 20th. And have several speakers talking about style and format, um, about uh, primary sources that can be used for historical veracity. We'll talk about growing our audience and writing for um, online platforms like, um, like um, um, you know, blogs and podcasts. And um, so, you know, part of what, how we define new writers is those who are writing for new um, distribution platforms and um, of getting, uh, getting to their audience, interested audiences. So if anyone's interested, I'm going to put my email address in the chat and you could get to me. 
Um, I'm sure we'll have a lot more Irish participants than American, you know, making the trip and all. It may have a help for you if you're really interested in coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Shout out to James, our other compatriot, right? Uh, <laughs> yes, my other boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this gets to the point she was making about a warm, welcoming group. Mm -hmm. Ross has reached out to me and has provided me help as a new writer. She spent a couple of hours with me on different occasions on the phone now, gave me some reading assignments. And uh, I really do appreciate that, James. Thank you. And Good. thank you, Laura. Okay, excellent. Excellent. And um, yeah, I, I, I understand you have uh, professors from uh, Trinity that'll be part of the uh, workshop? Actually, a, a postgraduate who's doing uh, research on medieval uh, lands and dynasties, and she'll be talking about the various um, ancient sources that she uses, primary sources, to make sure that things are consistent with uh, how it actually occurred. Great. Thank you again. Thanks, you, Larry. Thank you. But uh, I think a Christmas story isn't too far off, not for us in California, but I understand it's as cold as Christmas on in New York right now. Um, that's what I hear tell. Um, so all right, going moving on to our next, we have um, a poet, Rosalind Crowley. Um, home and culture are recurring themes in Rosalind Crowley's trilogy of point of connection, point of reflection, and point of perception. Her, her Irish heritage inspires her paintings and poetry. Due to her Irish American experience, she has written many poems that explore the sense of space, place, time, and belonging. Welcome, Rosaline. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm privileged and honored to be here in this wonderful group. Um, I thought I'd start with a poem about writing and it's from my uh, second book, uh, Point of uh, Reflection. So I'll just go straight in and I'll, I have a few poems. Um, I'll just go from one to the other. Writing. My next poem arrived in time to save me. Troubled with anxiety and doubt, it came to soothe and calm my inner self. Two steps forwards and three back, awake again to color and sound, vibrations of tingling, half pain, half pleasure to be writing. Earnest search for words, they come with consonants and vowels, a sequence of sounds built up with rhythm. The capitalized beginnings gone, replaced with closer to the ground letters, serving the same purpose to communicate. Line by line, verse by verse, repetition being a part of the hypnotizing beat, hammering home the sound of silence, alliteration finding its own effect to emphasize. How special language is and how words can fill your mind. Along with onomatopoeia and rhyme, the words spill and thrill, these new poems are newly crafted. The hope is to bring a spirit and a place, a headspace from which to make a difference. So I came to writing late and I always say it was the greatest gift because uh, I think I wouldn't have had too much to write earlier in my uh, life. Um, so, um, you know, as, as um, Laurie said, my Irish heritage inspires my poems. And uh, the distance of having lived in the States away from Ireland for over 30 years has made me who I am. So the next poem I have uh, here to read tonight is called The Best of Both Worlds. And I am over and back to Ireland. Before the pandemic, we went much more uh, two or three times a year, but since, uh, s since 2020, I guess we go, we stay longer. So I actually will be in Ireland in August, Larry. So I I'll talk to you later. The best of both worlds. Whether the sun shines or the wind blows, you'll find me on an airplane going home. Maybe you'll find me on a boat or a bus. Whatever the object of my transportation, I'm on my way. Driven by love or fear of losing ties, my vein is pumped and my heart is full. After soaking in the views and renewing senses, 
my mind returns, and then it's time to reverse the sojourn. Back again, my other home awaits. Two worlds exist, and I experience parallel lives. The hairdressers, the coffee shops, friends and family equally shape me. Except for sea and sand, my days are similar. Mirror images of self and self. My world is my world. So that was again from Point of Reflection. Um, and the uh, next two poems actually have historical um, sort of relevance. You know, sometimes knowing a little bit of history can be dangerous. So um, I'm going to preface this by saying I'm not a historian, but I, I, I have um, experienced history directly over my over my lifetime and and it seeps into you so uh, as a poet as a writer uh it's really about feelings for me so um i'm going to share two poems the first is a persona poem uh where um the title is terence mcsweeney and terence mcsweeney was an irish playwright an author and a politician and he was elected mayor of cork city where i was actually born so uh, I grew up knowing about Terence McSweeney and he was imprisoned uh, and for sedition, which for people who, who may not know, but sedition is a conduct or speech inciting people to rebel against the authority of a state or a monarch. And so he actually uh, was sent to prison in England and he died on hunger strike. So I'm going to read uh, my persona poem called Terence McSweeney. Oh, Ireland, dear, I have lived a moral life, leaving my wife and daughter behind, same as Patrick's sorrow, my sorrow too. Many more will not need to die as by this sacrifice, others will be encouraged to stay the course and seek unity through peace. No need to rise up. This protest will be a visible form for one and all. Don't shed a tear for me. I have made my case for freedom. Like any poet, my words will be my legacy, a soldier and a pacifist in omnia paratus. The river Lee runs through my veins to comfort me on my way. So just to some reference, besides the historical reference, Podrick would have been Podrick Pierce. And for your own um, reading, you might read the poem uh, Mother by Padraig Pierce, and, and you'll understand about sorrow. Um, and also um, the phrase uh, in omnia paratus means prepared for all things and ready for anything. So again, when I write, it just seems to come like I'm channeling. So it just came through me. Um, so that, uh, that is, uh, was one of these poems that I just felt the need to write. The next poem is called Forgiveness and Fences Mended. And it actually is about the burning of Cork. And Cork, um, as I say, I was born in Cork. It was uh, burned on the night of December 11th, 1920. So this is a time of, between 1919 and 1921 uh, where you had the War of Independence. And the burning of Cork was a reprisal by the RIC and the RIC was the Royal Irish Constabulary. Now they were made up of a British forces, but they also had um, what they call, you, you hear maybe as the black and tans and auxiliaries. If you want to read more about the uh, burning of Cork, I recommend that you read the auxiliaries uh, burn out the center of Cork city by John Dorney. So here's my poem called Forgiveness and Fences Mended, 1919 to 1921. Why did some die? For a cause, yes. For glory, no. For fame, no. Cut into pieces, unrecognizable, fallen to the ground like stars shooting and crashing out of sight. And then a city scorched, gone up in flames, red raw with memories and emotions, walked underfoot by generations. The houses rebuilt with fences made of knotty wood, soldiered up by concrete posts. 
now with voices and action and open hearts made of truth and honor, forgiveness in hand for those who savaged our people, we recognize the contributions of the martyrs, our benefit, our history, 100 years later. Tomorrow, the clouds will break up, sunshine will rain down upon us. So uh, they are um, in point of perception, at least one of them is the fence, the um, home forgiveness and fences is in point of perception. And I'm gonna finish with one poem. Last weekend was um, Mother's Day in Ireland and Mother's Day, uh, you know, so this is a poem from mothers around the world, mother um, figures. Um, and I've called it, and I'll finish on this one, called When I Was Young, My Mother Never Owned a Washing Machine. When I was young, my mother never owned a washing machine. She had two hands that lathered soap, then scrubbed, rinsed and, lather, uh, rinsed and squeezed out water. Cold as ice, she shook them until the wrinkles dropped. With pegs between her lips, she carefully released one at a time. Garments were hung out to dry, where wind then rain and wind again would make the clean clothes fly. The finer lace, she would lay flat. Later, she would steal a look from time to time to see if dried. At end of day, she unpegged the trove of clothes and brought them into fold. Familiar scene across Ireland, another day, another way, a mother showed her love. Thank you for listening. I appreciate being here. Look forward to hearing all the others. Thank you. That was terrific. Very nice, very nice, Rosalie. Especially love the mother poem and the poem about writing is was is just so true, just so true that your first one I really enjoyed that. How it works now is we take about Brendan about ten minutes or ten. Yeah, you know, however, you know, whatever seems right. I think ten is probably a good maximum. You know, okay. enough time to freshen your drinks and you know whatever. Yeah. If you have to go visit. <laughs> And, yeah. uh, and then people usually chat amongst themselves here, or you can, you know, if you can, you can unmute yourselves and talk among, uh, talk to each other. And um, we'll be coming back with our first, uh, or we will, we'll be starting the second act with some music. So. All right. All that and, was uh, fantastic. We should, yes. we should also give a, give a big thanks to uh, Lori for doing such a great job hosting tonight. <laughs> Yay. Yay. <laughs> And um, I'll just I'll just try to let everybody know for shiggles while the performance is going on. If you if you don't have your chat the dialogue open, you can unmute yourself temporarily to applaud by pressing your space bar. So, like for example, I mute myself, press the space bar, and now you can. Ta da! <clears throat> so. Uh, I want to thank also just on, you know, on behalf of, uh, of the group and, and, and Lori, thanks everybody for showing up and for getting through our, uh, our new, um, <laughs> our new barbed wire style uh, defenses in the, uh, in the security department for, for the Zoom, but uh, great turnout and we really, really appreciate you guys coming out for this. Um, we, uh, we have some other salons coming up in the near future. We're going to have another virtual salon actually the day after Easter um, that uh, our uh, uh, board member, actually our treasurer, uh, Sean O'Dowd is gonna be putting together um, around the theme of Irish independence. And then we're going to have another in-person salon towards the end of April. I'm not sure if it's gonna be the 25th or the 26th. We're still waiting to hear back from the uh, restaurant, but we're gonna be back at the Ellington where we uh, had our Christmas party and we had our first Upper West Side uh, in-person salon. So hopefully, um, and you know, obviously we're, we're at the whim of um, various different uh, uh, viruses and everything else going on around with weather and whatnot, but hopefully um, the world will still be, you know, in one piece and we'll all be safe to congregate um, at the Ellington um, in late April. But um, if you're not signed up, please join, uh, go to our newsletter uh, and you can sign up for that. But if you go to our main website, which is iamwa.org, um, uh, I'll put that in the chat. 
right after I finish writing my my rave review of the performance we just saw. I am WA dot org. And now you can go there and you can sign up for our website. You can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but especially you can sign up for our newsletter, get upcoming information, all kinds of stuff going on. Um, in fact, I see Sarah is here. Sarah, you've got a gig coming up this coming weekend. Oh, yes. On, on <clears throat> um, Saturday, April 2nd, Westchester at the Emlyn Theater, Ladies of Laughter is producing a show. So there are going to be four women who are comedians and our Maureen Langan, who's been participating in our group and she was at our last salon oh, thank you. on the bill uh, yeah and oh, maureen thank you for such a wonderful echo article you can tap it yeah, I I here <laughs> up here to everyone so you start typing oh, sure. just fyi guys um since i don't have anybody spot lit if you're if you're not muted, you'll pop up on the uh, screen if you make sound, which is why we're getting um, Paul's uh, <laughs> tech back back behind the scenes thing. But um, Paul, you were talking a little bit earlier about just the experience of when you were rehearsing with with uh, with uh, Maria and Annalise. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be making this any kind of a formal thing. People should talk. Right. and drown me out please but um but since you had mentioned i thought i thought it was would be nice for for everybody to hear what you had said at the outset you know it's just just a real thrill i've been working on this trilogy for about 20 years and to have have probably no greater character in it than than uh, uh mary the mother who goes through a tremendous change uh in the three 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 the three books to see uh to see uh maria just bring her to life it was just wonderful, and and uh, Annalise was uh, uh, when I when we were first doing it. Of course, I'm saying maybe she didn't see the words she's supposed to speak now, and I realized <laughs> that she's acting, <laughs> that she's reacting to, you know, she's reacting to what we spoken, and she's just her. Of course, when you're writing it, you write it all the time. You just write the next word, but. But the the uh, and then with, with Anna we, uh, with Maria I was uh, she first took Mary to be a certain thing and then we talked about the senses basically a, a, a soliloquy and she just and as she did here she just brought it in I mean the, it was wonderful I I mean this is one of the one of the kicks it really is to see uh, see somebody who uh, in the novel itself uh, uh, Mary goes from a second tier character. Uh, into this, into the, into the, the first one, into the second book, she becomes a major person. This, by the way, is the, is, is the dead center of the trilogy. Mary understands what she did, and 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 Maria really brought it out. She gets down to this one paragraph. She said, "I did mean to hurt him. That's what I meant to do, and I really hurt him, and I'm really sorry." And and both of their lives build from this. This is about two thirds of the way through the novel, and both of their lives build through this. And what happens with uh, with uh, Mary Kate not long after this is that uh, well I, if, anyway she understands this person she's been seeing and and she goes to him because he needs her so she's over this love at twenty one or twenty two of wanting to have a relationship with a person and start off in life she now can respond to. Uh, she can now respond to this person's need. And she actually leaves the party and everybody understands. So it's it's the middle of the trilogy in the sense that there's the breakthrough of, of the Irish mindset, all right? That the meanness that was expressed in so many cases and, and what Mary did to her daughter, uh, she her, her, her hate for the British was so great that she destroyed for a while her daughter's life, the most precious thing in the world to get back at somebody she'd never even met. And, and so the scene breaks it through. So they both come out of this with an understanding of love. The, the theme of the, of the trilogy is the triumph of love. And I cannot tell you even remotely that this was my idea when I started writing this thing in 2002. And uh, this scene's got more stuff in it than I really realized I'd written into it. <laughs> I was uh, listening to uh, Maria do the thing. I said, holy smoke, that's what she's doing. So I wrote that about, what, 15 years ago. 
and I'd like to think I was thinking and being that precise about it, but it just, it just that's how it worked. So uh, I thank all of you for listening in and especially Maria. Uh, and and, and it was, it's just, it was just a thrill. It really was. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. It was really fun to do, Paul. So thank you for inviting us to do it. It must be great to hear that, Maria, that you, you know, that you brought it to life for the author. That's really nice. It's really, really nice. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, they're his words. So, yeah. It's what it's they say in writing, and I, 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 had it to, I, I am a writer. I, I got through that a little while ago. I'm not getting any money for it or whatever. Uh, but they say how characters uh, just take over. And this yeah. one scene where Mary Kate is told that this uh, person up in New York that she's been seeing and can't really quite make the break to him, she finds out that his uncle has died. Uh, her uncle, uh, his, his uncle has died. He's a Jewish doctor. And, and that the uncle in 46 went to Europe, spent 18 months trying to find people. The only person he found was this Michael Reitman, who's the woman, who's the man that Mary Kate's developing this relationship with. And Mary Kate says, she comes back in from something, and her brother says that Michael Reitman called, this is before cell phones, of course, Michael Reitman called, and uh, he wanted to know that his uncle died. And so I had to write that. But I didn't write. Mary Kate just, Mary Kate just said, uh, he needs me. And it changes the whole scene. That's later on. And, but that word, that word came from the character. And I, said, I take credit in creating the character and the environment. But the actual words, the character said, I didn't say him. He needs me. And, and that breaks, that has changed my whole look at love. All right. So young love is engaging and having and et cetera. Mature love is understanding when people need you and then going to it. So that was, I was always afraid it looked too mechanical, you know, but uh, because there's a scene before this where Mary Kate understands uh, why she can't reconcile with this person that gets too, too complicated. But the thing is, she's come to an understanding by forgiving her mother. This is the mechanism. I, I just was a little ahead of myself. The mechanism is she forgave her mother. And as she forgave, as she be, she forgave her mother, she could find love with Michael Ryan. She couldn't do it till she got no this. I so, really like the contrast between the two versions of love. I think that's really interesting and very true to life yeah. and human. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's, cool. that's 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 why it's called a love story. In other words, mm -hmm. the there are different elements. And forgiveness is the greatest love of all, some right. might say. Some might say, yeah. So we're about a minute into going into the second act, but that was really fascinating. Um, being able, I, I think it's such a gift to be able to see people say your words out loud. That's a, that's a project I'm working on. Hopefully in June, I might have a table reading of something I'm working on. So I just can't wait for that, just to hear people say say the words you wrote. Uh, I'm going to spotlight you again, um, oh. Lori. So I, I think that, that that might be. Is that our is that our cue to uh, to get well, going? I, I, said I was giving it a one minute, but you know, I, oh. I, I okay. we are, we are ten. You know, I I don't want to be the 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 keeper of the clock, but um, so somebody needs to enforce some discipline around. Okay, it. Uh, then me. it will be me. I'll crack the whip. Okay, we're back. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so uh, we're now going to start our second half of the March Salon for Irish America Artists and Writers. And um, I am uh, happy to have be presenting to you to people I know very well who will be performing for you. Um, it's Billy and Pat. Okay, but yeah. are we doing that thing tomorrow? At noon? Yeah, at noon, great. Yeah, I think it's, yes. Someone needs to mute. Thank you. <laughs> oh, the joys of Zoom. So. Um, it's Billy and Pat Duffy. Uh, Billy and Pat Duffy are accomplished guitar bass duo. Both are in demand musicians and are members of several <laughs> California, uh, California bands. Um, there's too many to name because uh, I know I've seen them in different bands. I'll just name The Sheets and Badass Boots because I just like to say Badass Boots um, to name a few. 
Um, and today they'll be playing uh, some Bay Area New Age jazz, and they really just live like a couple of blocks down from me. I might be able to hear them live. So um, I'd like to welcome Billy and Pat Duffy. Can you say the name of this tune is Celtic Cross? Hi, we're going to do uh, two songs for you. Welcome to our, our home. This is our studio. And uh, we're going to do Celtic Cross first, and then we're going to do a song called Contemplation.
that was beautiful. I, I don't want to clap. I want to snap. I want to snap. That's how I feel about it. Yeah, that was really awesome, Pat and Billy. Thank you so much. Again, thank you for saying yes. It was right. just put me in a great mood. Okay. <laughs> thank you. We're on. <laughs> Okay. That was just, ah, I don't know about you, but I'm in a, I'm now in a little bit more of a California vibe. <laughs> I really am. It was great. Um, so uh, just a funny thing happened. I was listening to the radio this morning, uh, my favorite NPR station, KQED, and I got the tail end of it. And they said, I heard this word, they said, and I agree with what um, Raina Grandi just said about the uh, Patricios in Mexico. And I was like, I didn't know she was gonna be on my local radio show because she's on the salon this evening. So I'd like to introduce, cause it's one of my favorite un unknown stories but it's getting more known. It's the story of the San Patricios in the Mexican American war. So Re Raina Grandi, originally from Guerrero, Mexico, Raina is the author and bestseller of the best-selling memoir, The Dance Between Us, The Distance Between Us. I'm sorry, I gotta calm down. I'm getting too much of a California groove. I gotta wretch it up. So The Distance Between Us, published for adult and young readers. It was a book's critic, critic Circle Award finalist and the recipient of the International Literacy Association Children's Book Award. Her other books are a, Across a Hundred Mountains, Dancing with Butterflies, and A Dream Called Home. Her historical novel, A Ballad of Love and Glory, a story set during the Mexican-American War and was inspired by real events, was released this past March 15th. And this June, she releases another book, Somewhere We Are Human, Authentic Voices on Migration, Survival, and New Beginnings, an anthology by and about undocumented Americans. Raina lives in Woodland, California with her husband and two children. Welcome, Raina. Thank you so much. It's, it's so wonderful to be part of the salon. I know I'm not Irish, I am a Mexican writer, but my novel, A Ballad of Love and Glory is a celebration of the Irish heroes of Mexico, the San Patricios, and I wanted to share it with you because to me, it's such a special book to write, learning about the St. Patrick's Battalion, being able to write John Riley's story, his courage and his bravery. And to me, it's like a, a love letter and a thank you letter to John Riley and all the other um, Irish soldiers who fought to defend Mexico against the US invaders. So the, the novel, I actually dedicated it to the San Patricios who were hanged at the gallows. So if you see their names are listed. They were 50 members of the St. Patrick's Battalion that were hanged at the gallows for defending Mexico. And this is the, collectively, it's the largest hanging in US history but we don't really learn about it because we don't learn too much about the Mexican-American War of 1846. And I first heard about the San Patricios um, when I was promoting The Distance Between Us, my memoir in 2013, somebody came up to me in, um, at, at my event and said, hey, Reina, have you ever heard of the St. Patrick's Battalion? And I had not. And they told me that the St. Patrick's Battalion was a unit in the Mexican army composed of deserters from the US army, most of them Irish, who had switched sides to fight for Mexico. And I was so fascinated by the battalion. I was fascinated by John Riley, the leader, and I started to read everything I could about them. And pretty soon I started to think about writing a novel that, you know, to, 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 to celebrate and to acknowledge what they had done for my native country. So that is how I embarked on this seven years of writing this novel about the St. Patrick's Battalion. And I write it from John Riley's point of view 
So the novel is written in two points of view. Um, John Riley, uh, I write about him during his time in the US Army and the mistreatment that he witnesses and experiences at the hands of the Yankee officers. Uh, as you all know, at that time in the 1840s, there was a lot of migration from Ireland and from other parts of Eastern um, Europe. Um, and half of the US Army in the 1840s was foreign born and 25% were Irish. And then the other were, were German, some Italian, some Scots and Poles. And they not only experienced ethnic discrimination at the hands of US officers, but also religious discrimination because many of them were Catholic. And when John Riley enlisted in the US Army, he thought that he was gonna fight against England because at the time there, were ten, there was a lot of tension between the US and England over Oregon territory. And it turned out that he was not gonna fight against England. He was going to fight against Mexico, a Catholic nation. So the novel begins in March of 1846 when President Polk dispatches his troops to the Rio Grande to fight over the boundary with Mexico and to provoke an unjust war. And John Riley and the other, you know, Irishmen and, and, and German and Italian um, immigrants, they decide that they don't want to be part of this invasion, that they don't want to help the United States uh, be spoiled Mexico of its territories. And so they throw themselves into the Rio Grande and swim south and they switch sites and they join the Mexican ranks. So John Riley becomes a Lieutenant in the Mexican army. And a few months later, General Santa Ana uh, creates the Batallon de San Patricio, the St. Patrick's Battalion and puts John Riley as its leader. So my other character besides John Riley is a Mexican woman named Jimena, who is a healer, she's a folk healer. And at the beginning of the novel, her uh, husband is murdered by the Texas Rangers that have come down with the US Army and her ranch is burned to the ground. So she ends up joining the Mexican army as a nurse, as a combat nurse, and she's on the front lines of the war along with John Riley. And pretty soon they, they meet and an attraction blooms between them and they end up helping each other to survive through this very brutal invasion of, um, of the Republic of Mexico. Uh, one of the things I try to do as I was writing about John Riley and the San Patricios was to you know, pay very close attention to how John Riley might have experienced Mexico during the two years that, that he was part of the Mexican army. And I found so many, so many commonalities between Ireland and Mexico that I tried to draw upon with Riley. Um, of course, you know, there's a Catholic religion that both countries had in common, but Riley also saw, of course, um, how Mexico was, was being attacked by an Anglo-Saxon Protestant nation, how they were being invaded, um, and he wanted to help Mexico to defend itself. He didn't want Mexico to become another Ireland, you know, and being oppressed. And he didn't want the Mexican people to be like the Irish people who, who, whose lands were robbed and who were forced to be landless peasants. So to me, like that was something that was so important in terms of understanding why the real John Riley had made the decisions that he made, why he fought to defend Mexico, even though it was at great risk to himself because desertion was punishable by death. And as I mentioned earlier, many of the members of the St. Patrick's Battalion paid uh, a very heavy price for switching allegiances and for defending Mexico. So this novel is a, a love story 
it's a war story and it's also an immigrant story. And even though, you know, John Riley immigrated from Ireland in the 1840s and I immigrated from Mexico in the 1980s, I was still able to give him a lot of my own immigrant trauma because I realized as I was doing my research, how much I, I did have in common with John Riley in that, you know, as you, as you all know, Latino immigrants of today I se are severely demonized, reviled. They are, you know, one of the least unwanted immigrant groups in this country. Um, and that was the case also for the Irish immigrants that were coming in the 19th century where they experienced so much discrimination and, and they were also demonized and they were also made to feel rejected and unwanted. So I was able to draw from my own experience as an immigrant because ultimately immigration is a universal experience. And I wanted to, to um, be able to, to show um, what Latino immigrants, what Mexican immigrants um, have in common with the Irish immigrants of the 19th century. So thank you so much. I, I really hope that you know you pick up the book and that you enjoy it. Um, I am going to close my talk by sharing a song that was created specifically for the novel. And it's a ballad of love and glory. So we created a ballad that combines uh, Mexican music with the Irish music. So I hope you enjoy it. You're set to go if you want to share. Okay, so am I sharing my own screen? Uh, yes, if you can. Okay. Um... Let me see. Um, I'm not seeing it in my screen. Uh, if it's giving you a problem, I'll take care of it. Just give me one second. Okay. Can you play it from yours? Son of Erin, with no Irish luck or rank, forced away from County Galway to the Rio Grande Spence, where I hoped to prove my mettle in the army of the Yens. From San Nun, Tonio de Beja, from Teja.
Thank you so much. Sorry about um, that. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, that, that's just a little snippet of the song. And I wanted to show you that's the way the book is written as well, from alternating mm -hmm. points of view between John Riley and Jimena. So the song also needed to reflect that too, of the two of them sharing their stories and um, and also, you know, the, the, the love that grows between them and how that helps them to survive through this very brutal invasion. So th thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, yes. That was so uplifting, I felt. And I, I just loved hearing the Irish mariachi music. I, I just I just love that fusion and that blend. It was really, really terrific. And I've been fascinated by the San Patricio story. Actually, a few salons back um, when I hosted, we had someone who did a San Patricio like radio play that they were writing. So it is a story that is that is, I think, getting to be a lot more known. And it will definitely get more known, Raina, because of your, your, your book. I can't wait to read it myself. So thank you so much. This was a, a perfect, you know, not being Irish. You don't have to be Irish, please. You just, you, we, we just want these stories and the, you tell a good story. And that's, that's, what, mm -hmm. that's what this is all about. So thank you. Um, this, that was really wonderful. So we're, we're winding down, we have two more. Um, and uh, we uh, are moving to another person who tells a good story. And that is uh, James Ross, my other good luck charm for my salons. Um, and his, uh, in his debut novel, Hunting Teddy Roosevelt, it won the Independent Press uh, Distinguished Favorite Award for his for historical fiction and was a finalist for the National Indie Excellence Award. And it's a great book uh, if you've not read Hunting Teddy Roosevelt. Um, he has his, his debut mystery novel, Cold Water Revenge, uh, won the Firebrand Book Award for legal thrillers. And he is, it's now that's going to be a series and he's, uh, in coming in April, Cold Water Confession is scheduled for release April uh, 2022. And um, I hope the series goes on and on. And I believe he'll be reading from the upcoming book. I'd like you to welcome James Ross. Thank you, Laurie, for having me here. Um, oh, something just happened to my video. But can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yes, the, the this is a reading from uh, the second book in the Cold Water Mystery Series, uh, which will come out uh, next month, uh, towards the end of April. And... Um, uh, uh, hopefully it will uh, have the same level of success as the first book, which probably won a half a dozen awards at this point. Uh, although as uh, uh, many of my fellow writers on this Zoom know that uh, awards and sales are two different things, uh, sadly, but uh, uh, it, it does tend to get the word out as do uh, salons like this. So uh, I do enjoy being here. Um, all right, this is a scene from Coldwater Confession. Uh, it's the opening day of school. Uh, and one of the main characters uh, is the newly minted uh, first grade teacher um, who's uh, going to have a difficult day. Sister Mary Judith kept the door of her classroom open and her ear out for trouble. The first week of school always brought something eighth grade boys, some of them now bigger than the teachers, sneaking into town at lunchtime, girls rolling up their skirts and experimenting with makeup, first graders getting lost on the way back from the cafeteria. Things never settled down until the end of September. Before that, anything could happen. But Sister Judith's radar was tuned to the twos and fews, the lost child, the guilty giggle, the whiff of drugstore perfume. Crisis rarely struck an entire classroom. But Kathy O'Hara, a pretty seventh grader not given to tattling or known for exaggeration, appeared in the doorway of the sixth grade class and said that it had. Something's wrong in the first grade classroom, sister. They're all in there running around and screaming. Sister Judith stepped into the hall where she could hear the commotion clearly. Is there a teacher in there, she asked. I don't know, sister. It's Miss Ryan's classroom, 
and the boys are all running around and some of the girls are crying. Sister Judith ordered her class to open their Baltimore catechisms and begin reading while she went back down the hall to investigate. There were always those teachers who had difficulty maintaining classroom discipline, new teachers especially, but it was not often an issue with the younger grads. Miss Ryan did not seem to be the type that would have a problem in that area. But it was quickly clear that Miss O'Hara had not exaggerated. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Small blue trousered boys in wrinkled white sh shirts and clip-on ties twirled up and down the aisles like dervishes. Plaid skirted chalk faced girls huddled at their desks, looking ready to burst into tears. Sister Judith took a deep breath and brought her hands together in a sharp clap. Boys, back to your seats. She grabbed a nearby dervish by the ear and held him tight to her side. Immediately, scraping chairs, shuffling feet. When the noise subsided, she added, sit up straight, hands on your desk. 37 pairs of small white hands, five rows of six and one of seven, did as they were told. Do you have your rosary, Miss O'Hara? No, sister. Sister Judith removed a rope of wooden beads from a fold in her habit and handed it to the girl who received it as if it were a relic of the one true cross. Please lead the class in the rosary, Miss O'Hara, all five decades in each of the joyful and sorrowful mysteries. Yes, sister. I'll be back before you're finished. Sister Judith looked down at the boy whose ear remained clamped between her thumb and index finger. Come with me. Almost as an afterthought, she turned to the classroom and asked, does anyone know where Miss Ryan is? A small redhead girl in the front row raised her hand. Sister nodded. She said she'd be right back. Sister Judith dragged the anonymous anonymous miscreant toward the principal's office. He said nothing, a sure sign that he had older brothers or sisters who had gone through the school before him. As they rounded the corner by the statue of the Virgin, he raised his hand and tried to turn his face toward hers, a physical impossibility given the grip she maintained on his ear. Sister, hush, but sister, I said, hush, I have to go to the bathroom. Sister Judith shoved his nearest suitable door. It happened to be Mark Girls, but she doubted a first grade boy in an extremis would notice the homogeneous plumbing. She waited impatiently outside. Miss O'Hara could keep the first graders busy with the rosary for 15 minutes at most. The sixth graders she had left unsupervised with their catechisms would last half that long. She knocked briskly on the lavatory door and stuck her head inside. Finished up in there. Quick, she waited another nanosecond and then entered. A half inch of water covered the tile floor. Ugh, now what? Gathering the hem of her habit, she splashed around the modesty panel that blocked the view of the interior. The dervish stood beside an overflowing sink, his hands on the faucets. Above it, facing the mirror, the first grade teacher, Miss Ryan, turned one hand over the other in the air above the basin, in a motion that reminded Sister Judith of a slow moving cement mixer. I turned the water off, sister, the boy said. Miss Ryan? Sister Judith spoke softly. There was no response. She approached the sink and placed her hand on the teacher's arm. Miss Ryan gave no sign that she was aware of the other two people in the room. Sister Judith spoke to the boy. Child? Yes, sister. What's your name? Michael Dooley, sister. Do you know Father Gauss, Michael? Yes, sister. Do you know where to find him? At the rectory, sister. Go there now and bring him to me. Bring him here. Yes, sister. And do not speak to anyone on the way there or back. Do you understand? Yes, sister. Am I still in trouble, sister? No, Michael. Now do as I told you. And, uh, that's an example of what you will find when you order the latest book in the cold water mystery season series, rather, you'll find out what Maggie was, Miss Ryan was doing at that sink, why she was 
uh, turning one hand over the other, why she was suddenly comatose, and whether that is evidence of her participating in a murder uh, to be solved at the end of the book or not. <laughs> and I apologize for this video. I don't know what's going on. Uh, uh, but hopefully you can hear my voice and you heard the story. We heard, we heard the story loud and clear and it came across very well. Yes, the video was funky, but uh, his, the cold water confession, um, I'm sure is gonna be great because cold water revenge was a great kickoff in his series of his books. Um, loved it. Uh, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you so much, Jane. So we are getting there. So um, I'd like now to uh, introduce our film and then we'll have one person after the film. Um, so I'd like to introduce, I wish that wouldn't do that. Um, Kelly Candeli, Candeli, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, I apologize, has had a diverse career as a writer, filmmaker, organizer, and elected official in Los Angeles, another Californian. Um, Kelly has written extensively for the Los Angeles Times, for the New York Times, the Nation Magazine, and other national publications. He covered the Northern Ireland peace process for the Los Angeles Times and has written articles for Irish American Magazine. Kelly has produced and directed a number of documentary films, one, um, A League of Their Own, um, it's about his mother's years as a professional baseball player in the 1940s. And that was awarded an area Emmy. This evening, he will be showing his film, St. Kevin and the Blackbird at Wilshire Grand. And I'm gonna be reading along with my Seamus Heaney book. Um, and I'd like to welcome Kelly Candeli. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here tonight and uh, congratulations to all of the other presenters. It was some, uh, some beautiful work. Uh, what you're gonna be watching uh, shortly is just a, a little uh, video documentary that I made at a construction site, uh, the Wilshire Grand uh, Hotel, where I spent three years uh, filming the, the site and talking to the workers who were building this building uh, from bottom to top. Uh, I have an interest in, in labor. Uh, I've taught labor history. I have an interest in uh, working people. Uh, I have an interest in uh, obviously Irish uh, literature and, and poetry. And the, the real inspiration for bringing a poem to a work site, construction site, which I've never seen done, what was uh, reading about Samuel Gompers, who was uh, um, the founder and president of the American Federation of Labor, in his autobiography, if you, if you take a look at it, he, he writes about and, and tells about um, setting aside cigars for workers at the plant he was at so that they could make their, their, their money on the cigars but uh, that they were rolling, but also read to the workers while they were working in, in the factory. And it just... You know, I thought about that and I thought, well, what a way to uh, erase the, you know, boundary between manual labor and, and culture and, and intellectual work that these folks were reading poetry and politics and history to all these workers that were rolling cigars. And uh, it inspired me to take this poem by, by Seamus Heaney out of uh, the spirit level, a wonderful uh, book of poems. Uh, St. Kevin and the Blackbird, which Heaney describes and others describe as, as a poem of, uh, of stamina uh, in the words of another poem that he wrote that's also out of, out of the spirit level of, of keeping going, uh, which, he, which he referred to his brother Hugh uh, back in, in, in near Derry, who stayed there uh, when, when Seamus and he moved to uh, Dublin. But uh, I took this poem to this uh, construction site, I asked plumbers and iron workers and crane operators and laborers and painters, electricians to read the poem uh, and, then, and then talk about it. And uh, it was surprising to me and interesting to me uh, what they said, because I thought it was just full of wisdom and, and insight. 
None of them knew who Seamus Heaney was, uh, but the poem really resonated with them. And if you read it, you would, you would understand why. And so you'll hear the, the workers reading it in this video, and then of course, talking about it. So that's kind of the backstory for uh, this little video. This poem is called St. Kevin and the Blackbird. And then there was St. Kevin and the Blackbird. The saint is kneeling, arms stretched out. Inside his cell, but the cell is narrow, so. One turned up palm is out the window. Stiff as a crossbeam when a blackbird lands. And lays in it and settles down to nest. Kevin feels the warm eggs, the small breasts, the tuck neat head and claws and finding himself linked into the network of eternal life is moved to pity. Now he must hold his hand like a branch out in the sun and rain for weeks till the young are hatched and fledged and flown. And since the whole thing's imagined anyhow, imagine being Kevin. Which is he? Self-forgetful or in agony all the time. From the neck on out, down through his hurting forearms. Are his fingers sleeping? Does he still feel his knees? Or has the shut-eyed blank of under earth crept up through him? Is there a distance in his head? Alone and mirrored clear in love's deep river. To labor and not seek reward, he prays. A prayer his body makes entirely. For he has forgotten self, forgotten bird, and on the riverbank, forgotten the river's name. St. Kevin seems to me like a very unique selfless person that sacrificed his body for a greater cause, for nature, to give those birds a home. And without even signs of pain or anything, for them to have to wonder, is his finger numb? Does his arms hurt? You know, you don't know because he's just doing the best job he can. He's not looking for any pity or any reward in return. And it's kind of like in construction with your body, it's a lot of physical demanding labor. The putting your hand out for help, and then once that help is given, it's, it's not always maybe what you would think it would be because there could be a lot of, of pain involved with the accomplishment of hatching the eggs or turning into an apprentice and then coming into being an iron worker journeyman. The poem is very interesting because as plumbers, as construction workers, just like uh, the saint on the poem, we end up having to sacrifice our bodies. I mean, I used to read poems at school, but this is the first time I've actually had to do it right here at work. I feel like us construction workers are kind of like St. Kevin. It also sounds like he might be a little bit crazy in his head because it might be imagined, but I don't know. You get so concentrated in uh, the, the task at hand and you know, you just lose yourself in the, in the work that, you, that you're doing. Yeah, I've done that. I do that all the time. I lose myself in my work. But in the end, it's all worth it for your family. It provides for them, so that's a good thing. Small sacrifice to make. You know, we come to work every day. We don't have sick time hours or vacation hours, so we work every day until the job is complete. Yeah, uh, forgetting self, forgetting the bird, and while standing on the riverbank, forgetting the river's name. I hope to achieve that in my own life where I can be more selfless and not, not be concerned so much about what I can get out of things or what, can be, what it can do for me. What can I do as a person to help whoever it is that needs help? In the poem, it's like he goes into a meditative state. He's in his own zone. He's, he's dedicated to his cause. He loses track of the name of the river. He just, he becomes that tree that he's meant to be. He becomes one with what he's doing.
Not really any any final thoughts um, other than you know it was part of a larger piece on workers uh, the relationship between mind and hand intelligence and and physical work and uh, it was just a great experience for me to uh, and the, the surprising thing is that nobody nobody complained no no foreman came over and said what are you doing with a book of poetry on on this construction site i wasn't thrown off by the superintendent or the or the or the contractor they kind i think they a little there i think they kind of thought that it was nice that a nice uh, respite from welcome <laughs> from the labor we hear you, you. Saw the photographs wonderful <laughs> Okay. Oh, so. that's not okay. Great. Hello there. Welcome home. <laughs> Hi, love. <laughs> great to see you. Do you have a great time? Yeah. yeah. I think you're on a Zoom call. Huh? I think, you're I think Zoom call. he's greeting his uh, family. Oh, so I'm on there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we're here. We're all we're no, all listening. You. Huh? Not on you. You need to go on you. No, it was on. Uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, I will in a bit. Why don't you go ahead and introduce him while while okay? We're safe. I just oh, wanted yeah. to say that was just so. There was just the simplicity of that video, and the the insights of of the construction workers just moved me so that I just, I I was I was so thrilled that I you you got to share that with me and we got to share that at the salon. There was there was just something so profound about that. Um, and thank you, thank you so much, um, Kelly. And um, I, 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 we now will be finishing with uh, the man of the hour, the man who needs no uh, um, introductions. <laughs> Although I do have a photo of me on his lap. That's me <laughs> on Zoom. And I am on Maliki's lap. What is it? <laughs> the man who needs no interruption. <laughs> no, no introduction, but a few interruptions. Um, yeah. Welcome Maliki McCourt, founder of this organization. Let's see, wait. We get him on the. Uh, I'm not sure if he. No, I, I, I'm not sure if he's aware. Maliki, <laughs> you're on. Hello, Maliki. Adam and lost him. I'll tell you what, uh, Lori, I'm gonna just. I'm gonna. Hey. I'm gonna put you back on for a minute. I'll see if sure. I can raise him on the other line. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just. I just thought it was so so profound. Um, uh, and. Uh, so Maliki's not there, uh, but this I I I uh, can't wait to hear what Maliki has to say. But I I I thought this has been a pretty enjoyable salon, um, and if anyone else wants to say anything before Maliki joins us, Brava, Lori, well done, well done. <laughs> Thank you. They can't. This can't be done without Brendan. Brendan's really the glue. Brendan. <laughs> oh, some wonderful, wonderful Ooh. stuff here. There he is. Hey. Um, there he is. Here's mute. our mute. Stay mute. On mute. <laughs> we can hear you. We can hear you, Maliki. I don't know what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. But I missed uh, I missed the uh, whole thing. But not, not most of it. I just did, uh, I did not see my uh, emails today. For some reason, I was looking at it. So, uh, I did. Uh, here we are. Uh, you're covering your mic, Malachi. You're covering your mic. What's that? Oh, I. Your see. hand okay. is over your microphone. Oh, of course. I, yeah. See, I'm doing everything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> did uh, <laughs> I? And I was. Yes, uh, and my my son and his children just came back from. Uh, the Bahamas, and they just walked in the door. So I gather I was greeting them. <laughs> and uh, anyway, it's all a mess for me. <laughs> so I am, I'm very sorry. I, um, I, I was not uh, prepared for, uh, for this evening. But I see, uh, yeah, but I was checking in, and I saw there were a fair amount of people attending. And... Uh, and I'm sorry I can't comment or, uh, or, 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 or compliment on the, uh, on, on the story 
on the stories and the uh, presentations this evening. But uh, congratulations and, and thank you, Laurie, for uh, hosting it and Brendan as uh, for facilitating me getting I think you got me in here anyway. Anyway, I'm uh, stretched out on my, uh, on my bed and, uh, and, and I should have been uh, attending uh, this, uh, this salon. Uh, this, uh, I think it might be, uh, I'm not sure how long we've been doing the uh, salons, but um, it occurred to me one evening that we ought to be doing something more uh, the Irish American writers should be just doing something more than uh, having general meetings. So it occurred to me that uh, I checked in with the symphony space and they said, yeah, you can have the place. And we did. And that's how it all started. And uh, we need to be able to do that and uh, never never apologize for our work because we are just, uh, if it weren't, if we weren't trying our best, then we'd, uh, we need to be found guilty. But most of us, uh, once we put the pen to paper and we write and we share, that's the best we can do for, uh, for that moment. So don't, uh, don't ever start a reading with an apology for any part of it. Simply do it. Say, say it, sing it, uh, and, and dive, dive uh, right in. Uh, I used to be embarrassed about my lack of, uh, of formal education. And then I left school when I was uh, 13. But then I realized uh, my brother left school at 13 too, but then he got a Pulitzer Prize, so uh, that's okay. That, that's the way to get a Pulitzer Prize, leave school at 13. <laughs> <laughs> they screw you up in school and they put ideas into your head. But uh, the way they make it, make it sound like you're, um, that the, what is important is, uh, Grammar, grammar. Now, I have no idea of uh, English grammar or a grammar as applied to the English language, even less to the Irish language, because it, um, it uh, I, I thought a dangling participle had something to do with sexual activity. I didn't <laughs> know it was a grammatical thing, but, uh, but I still, I still don't know anything about grammar, and I really don't give a fiddler's fart because, <laughs> there, do you know that there are people that are employed by publishers and they are called editors? <laughs> they edit things for you. So you don't have to think about it. All you have to do is go for it. It was like when I was, uh, I used to be on uh, radio. I'm still on radio on Sundays on WBAI. But when I was at WMCA, which was the first uh, all talk radio show in, uh, in, in New York. And uh, I just told people when I got the job there, I had no experience on about uh, broadcasting. But all I did was talk. And that's all there was too. And I said, so therefore what it come out, came out, I couldn't wait to hear what I had to say next, because it was all new to me. <laughs> and I absolutely, the main thing anyway, is to enjoy yourself and write what's, uh, and go fast, go keep going as fast as you, as you can. And, uh, and have fun. That's the way to do it. And that's, that has to do with all forms of communication, really, be the film, as we had, and uh, writing stories and singing the song. 
So sing the song, write the story and play it, sing and dance if you have to and have fun. So that's it for me. Um, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> I take my advice. I never use it. <laughs> and uh, that's another thing is giving advice as uh, we do. We don't have to do that when we get old. I'm 90 and uh, I'm always given advice. As I say, I don't use it. So what the hell? Well, you might as well give it away. And that's it. So I don't work for a living. I get along all right without. I don't toil all day. I suppose it's because I'm not built that way. Some people work for love and say it's all sunshine and game. But if I can't get sunshine without any work, I think I'll stay out in the rain. Oh, give me a nail and a hammer and a picture to hang on the wall. <coughs> give me a strong step ladder. You know that I might fall. Give me a couple of waiters and a barrel of good old basil. And I bet you I'll hang up that picture if someone will drive the nail. I don't work for a living. I get along all right without. I don't toil all day. I suppose it's because I'm not built that way. Some people work for love. Stay, it's all sunshine again. But if I can't get sunshine without any work, I think I'll stay out in the rain. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank Blessings you, you. on all the craniums. <laughs> Yay. 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 Thanks, Thanks very much. Right on. Thank you, Maliki. Blessings. <laughs> Blessings. I'm going to jump it back to you, uh, Lori. Okay. And, um, Thank you, Lori. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Matthew. You're a love. <laughs> Eloquent, as usual. Uh -huh. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You only you only are saying that because I have a photo of me on your lap. So I think that, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank everyone who presented and, and participated uh, and especially Brendan, who, as I call the glue to, of this organization, especially the salons, it's it's it, it, there's always magic that happens, and and even the magic of Zoom, which you know sometimes we hear voices when we don't want to, and and then and then sometimes we can't get in the Zoom room when we need to, but it all happens, and it all it all came off, and I have to say I'm very proud of this evening, and I loved every every present presentation from our Irish harpist to our California jazz to our um, to our authors. I loved hearing, uh, James Ross brought me right back to my Catholic school in St. Simon Stock. And um, I, I could just picture it all. And I um, and then learning about the San Patricios is just always a story. I just can't wait to get that book. So I, I'm, I know I might be forgetting. I know we had a poet and we had a dramatic reading that was just so, so, um, uh, so moving. Um, and that the most moving I think was the, the, the film, the Seamus Heaney being read at a construction site was just brilliant. I wanna thank you all. Uh, this is the end of the salon. It doesn't mean that we go away. I think some people can chat or ask questions but this is the end of the formal salon. Thank you again. Yes, and once again, thank you, Laurie. Great job. Great. <laughs> and uh, check out our newsletter, check out our website and uh, stay in touch. Join, if you if you're haven't already joined the, the organization. There's never a bad time, really. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. It was wonderful. Just wonderful. Oh, thank you. Amazing, Kathleen. Yes. And all the presenters, amazing. Yes. Have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.
Also want to say a quick shout out to uh, Ariana Kashishian, who is actually going to be doing the uh, blog for tonight's uh, salon. So thanks in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to thank everybody again. I'll be getting off and, uh, and whatever, but it was, uh, it was great. I appreciate it. I, uh, I really did. Thank you very much. It was a lot of fun. And again, uh, thanks to uh, Maria and uh, Anna Lee. Thank Great you. having you, Peter. And, yeah, and, and also for getting this thing working. Uh, <laughs> it's really amazing. I, I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. Right. It was an amazing night, Lori. You did a fabulous job getting this thing together. Thank Great you, Maria. Wonderful. Really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, we, I was I was very pleased that that everybody showed up because we did it did we we were getting it took a little we were late getting the note and the and the Zoom link out to everybody, but thank you all very much for coming. Yes, thank you. Anger break. All right. How do you recommend right, right. somebody like um, that here's something called Duffy's Cut, the massacre in Pennsylvania, and it was uh, by the Watsons. And okay. there's actually a song.